is the first video in the series on um, liver and gallbladder pathology. Uh, in this first video, I'm going to talk a bit about kind of an overview of liver gallbladder disease, then talk about some of the biomedical assessment uh, techniques and methods, and then say a little bit about uh, functional liver disorders, which is a lot of uh, what a lot of integrative practitioners tend to focus on. These are not overt lesional liver disorders, but when we talk about poor liver detox and things like that, I want to say a bit of a word about that. And then in subsequent videos, we'll look at individual uh, liver conditions. So with uh, most functional liver disorders, there's no need for any extensive workup, but for definite signs and symptoms of liver disorders, and that would include a lot of our red flags, like the presence of jaundice, so yellowish skin, yellow sclera, dark urine with stools, uh, and then interestingly, another symptom of jaundice often is systemic pruritus itching. Uh, the bile salts as they accumulate in the skin get very uh, itchy. Um, and uh, there's a lot of causes, so that could be hepatitis, that could be obstruction, like biliary tract obstruction, even cancer, things like that. So uh, presence of jaundice requires workup to, to really get to the, the root of to what it is. Um, any sort of severe or uh, right hypochondriac pain up in the upper right, right quadrant and malaise for more than three days. Uh, again, a lot of different causes, but that should be uh, further investigated. Uh, any vomiting of fresh or altered blood, especially with the coffee ground appearance. Uh, uh, as we mentioned with um, esophageal varices, that indicates potential upper GI bleeding, uh, or that can also be uh, from an esophageal tear. Um, and that can be severe because patients can lose a lot of blood volume, go into shock, so that needs workup. And then a history of any liver disease with the presence of ascites, um, bruising, altered mental status, that indicates a decline in liver function, so especially ascites and remember that's a buildup of fluid in the peritoneal space um, often you can see what's called a fluid wave if you press hard on one end of the abdomen one side of the abdomen you'll see sort of a wave of fluid go across uh, the belly um, you can also take a flashlight and put it to the side of the belly and if it kind of lights up that's uh, indicating fluid um, so this requires an urgent evaluation to kind of assess that um, so we're going to be looking for the red flags, need for any urgent referral. Um, a lot of the chronic liver disorders like hepatitis, viral hepatitis and whatnot, hepatitis C will need the uh, specialist usually, and that's usually a gastroenterologist who's further specialized in hepatology. Um, many chronic liver diseases uh, really are not symptomatic until the later stages, and that shows us a lot about the fact that the liver is highly regenerative has all of this uh, inner life activity, and it really it won't start showing signs and symptoms until well over 80, even 90% of the liver has been compromised. Um, so that is why sometimes, like with the viral hepatitis, like Hep C, we often just find that incidentally on um, testing. We find elevated liver enzymes. We go looking, and we find uh, there's hepatitis virus there. Um, so some of the typical assessment methods for liver gallbladder disorders would be full history course. Uh, physical exam, so our vitals, looking for jaundice, abdominal exam, uh, edema, ascites. Our labs would be things looking at um, for presence for anemia, red cells, white cells for infection or platelets. Um, also different tests looking at electrolytes, so that would be our complete metabolic panel, and that has some of the liver enzymes, and the two big liver enzymes, if you skip down here to the liver function test, uh, and I'll talk more about those in just a minute, are ALT-AST, and then GGT and AL alkaline phosphatase, ALP, are um, more tests of gallbladder function and biliary tract function. Uh, and then bilirubin also is going to tell us, bilirubin of course is what causes jaundice. It's the pigment that builds up in the blood that normally should be excreted through the bile, but in this case it builds up in the blood. Uh, now the liver is very important for synthesizing, remember, all of our plasma proteins, including our coagulation proteins. So uh, in advanced liver disease like cirrhosis, we're going to actually run coagulation tests to check for clotting function, and that would be the prothrombin time. Uh, or the internationalized ratio, which is the INR, uh, PTT, and then fibrinogen, remember, is the precursor to fibrin, and the liver is synthesizing that. So if that's very low, that indicates the liver is not able to do that, and that person's going to be at much higher risk for uh, internal bleeding as a result.
Um, if there's any suspected infection, there are hepatitis panels for, uh, we'll talk about all five hepatitis viruses coming up here. And then a special test, alpha-1 antitrypsin. Uh, this is a protein that's put out by the liver. It actually inhibits uh, neutrophil elastase. So neutrophils have an enzyme that can break down elastin. And this is a real problem in organs like the lung and the alveoli. They need lots of elastin. If those neutrophils are not, if that elastase is not combated, your own neutrophils can destroy your alveoli. And that's what actually happens in emphysema. Uh, there's a rare fairly rare genetic form of emphysema where the liver does not genetically cannot make this protein so it doesn't go into the blood and that's called alpha-1 antitrypsin um, and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is also associated with chronic uh, liver disease chronic hepatitis um, there's a couple of other conditions we'll see the liver can unfortunately accumulate copper and store up copper and that is something called wilson disease you get copper toxicity you can also uh, store up iron and that's called hemochromatosis and these are usually due to genetic reasons um, but there are specific markers that we can use for that so those would be some of the classic blood tests for um, liver disease and then our classic imaging for liver would be an abdominal ultrasound that's very widely used to detect gallstones and things um, mri ct and geography i'll talk about all these in just a moment here ercp uh, that is essentially where we're taking the endoscope down into the duodenum up into the biliary ducts and that can remove stones take biopsies uh, examine and so forth um, and then liver biopsy itself that's done through the abdominal wall um, and that can stage the liver for different degrees of fibrosis and cirrhosis. Uh, and that's important for things like he chronic hepatitis C infection. We often need to do liver biopsies in the later stages to assess the amount of fibrotic damage that's occurring. Uh, more and more, there are blood tests that are sort of being done to replace the liver biopsy. As we'll see, there are associated adverse effects with that, as you can imagine. Um, but um, these are all the basic kind of biomedical assessment tools for liver function. Liver function tests are probably the most widely used uh, blood test specific for the liver. Um, these measure enzymes in the blood that have been released from damaged or dying liver cells. Um, and so it can detect the presence of liver disease or liver injury. And it can help us distinguish between different types of liver disease as well. Um, it can also be used to follow response to treatment, or in the case of chronic hepatitis viruses like hepatitis C, it can uh, allow us to assess the amount of liver injury and, and over time. Um, so some of the classic liver tests, I'm going to actually skip to the biggest ones here, and that would be ALTAST, as I mentioned, alanine transaminase, aspartate transaminase. Transaminases, um, we haven't discussed them yet, but basically they are enzymes that when you're done with amino acids, when they need to be eliminated from the body, um, we have to remove the ammonia, NH2 group. And um, there's a couple of ways they can do that. The liver can remove the ammonia form from the carbon skeleton that was part of that amino acid. And um, remember, amino acids are uh, carbon with the hydrogen with the NH2 group, a carboxylic acid group, and um, one of 20 side chains for the protein forming amino acids. So to get rid of this amino acid, the liver has to remove the ammonia. Now ammonia is very toxic, so it can do it in two different ways. It can make urea out of it, and urea will be eliminated by the kidneys, or it can transfer it to another sugar, and that's called transamination. So it basically takes it and uh, puts it onto another sugar, and then this carbon skeleton can be recycled uh, and so forth. Um, but the transamination, these enzymes are what participate in that. So these are normal um, detox, you know, protein, amino acid detoxing, recycling enzymes in the liver. They're, they're released into the blood at a constant rate, e even in normal health. Um, so there's always a little bit in your blood. Um, but with any sort of liver injury, when liver cells are injured, you're gonna see a lot of these spilling into the blood. So we call these liver enzymes, they're a marker of the liver injury. Um, they also go by the name of SGPT and SGOT, but typically today we use ALT, AST. Um, and uh, these will be increased in the case of ALT and hepatitis. You'll see 
uh, very high levels. So usually our ranges are 10 to 40 international units per liter. We can see well over a thousand in hepatitis cirrhosis as well. Usually the levels aren't as increased as much because the liver cells are so badly damaged by that point. Uh, liver cancer, tumors. Uh, unfortunately, it can also indicate a lot of other issues, diabetes, uh, mononucleosis, choline deficiency, pancreatitis, any sort of myopathy as well um, will uh, increase the, so not super specific for the liver, but we, with our history and other exams, with elevated AST, that kind of narrows us into the liver. Uh, many drugs will also elevate ALT. Um, ALT is a more specific in, uh, indicator of liver cell injury than AST, the next one I'll talk about here. And when ALT is much greater than AST, that's going to indicate hepatitis. When AST is much greater than ALT, that's typical in liver cirrhosis. Uh, so AST, again, hepatitis, this can be increased, cirrhosis, liver cancer. Now, the um, ALT, again, is more specific in liver cells. It's found in other tissues. Unfortunately, AST is also found in the heart and muscle cells, a little bit in the brain and kidney. So any organ injury in those organs will also result in AST elevations, which is why it's not super specific for the liver. But in the context of ALT, it can give us um, good information. Um, and so you can see in MI, acute pancreatitis, any of these acute inflammatory issues, AST can be elevated. Now, those are the two more liver-specific. Um, Gallbladder-specific would be ALP and GGT. Um, so ALP, alkaline phosphatase, this is found in the cells lining the biliary ducts in the liver. And so any sort of bile duct obstruction, intrahepatic cholestasis, uh, infiltrated diseases of the liver, uh, it's also found in bone, major role in bone and placenta, uh, and so we might see in bone cancers. Uh, and this is one where in cancer patients, when I see a sudden uptick of ALP, that's quite concerning. That often indicates bone metastases, and now um, uh, the cancer has spread. Uh, many drugs can increase this as well, so we have to kind of look at that in context. GGT, another more biliary tract specific enzyme. So lots of different liver diseases, but especially bile duct diseases. Uh, alcohol abuse is gonna elevate most of these, but including GGT. And then we'll see it in, uh, elevated in, in uh, type two diabetes, pancreatitis, maybe cardiovascular disease. And lots of drugs and herbs like St. John's wort will elevate GGT. This is not to be memorized, but it's important to kind of know ALT, AST are two major liver enzymes. Uh, ALKFOS and GGT are two major biliary duct uh, enzymes. Bilirubin is of course the uh, breakdown of heme. Um, so when, uh, as we discussed with the spleen section, uh, when old red cells go through the spleen, they break open, the hemoglobin is uh, released, it's recycled, the globin is recycled, the heme, the iron is taken out and recycled, the heme then, the remainder is made into bilirubin. Uh, and that is going to uh, be what's called unconjugated bilirubin in the spleen. It's gonna actually attach itself to albumin in the blood, travel to the liver, and in the liver, it's gonna have glucuronic acid, a sugar attached to it. That's called conjugation. And so what actually enters the bile is called conjugated bilirubin. So bilirubin, really there's two different types. There is uh, the indirect bilirubin, that's the unconjugated, and then the direct bilirubin, and that's conjugated. You've add them together, that's total bilirubin. So if we do a complete metabolic panel, that's actually measuring just total bilirubin. Uh, we often have to do a liver panel more specific to actually differentiate indirect from direct. And so that'll be on that test. Um, so we're gonna see this in any of the things that can cause jaundice and we'll talk about those here in a bit. Different uh, conditions will cause either an increase of indirect or direct bilirubin and that can help us differentiate them. So I'll, I'll talk about that when I, we go into jaundice. Albumin is another major peptide um, major protein produced by the liver and its main role is to number one carry shuttle around different uh, insoluble molecules like I just talked about uh, bilirubin uh, but it's also going to be it's large enough that it stays within the plasma 
uh, inside your capillaries and your uh, peripheral spaces. Uh, there's a little bit of albumin outside, but not as much as inside. And as a result, via osmosis, the capillary membrane is permeable to water. It's not permeable to albumin under normal circumstances. Um, the water is going to move from the extracellular space into the capillaries. And that is going to draw water fluid back into your vascular system. So albumin has a major, major role of maintaining the plasma osmotic pressure. And uh, so when albumin levels are low, we're going to see fluid leaking out of vessels everywhere. Edema, but particularly in the peritoneal space, we're going to see ascites. And um, so that's often from the very low albumin. Um, and so we're going to see low albumin in chronic liver disease like cirrhosis and a more advanced hepatitis. Uh, in kidney disease, the little filtration units, the glomerulus in the kidneys become damaged. And as a result, albumin just leaks out and we'll find it in the urine. And the urine is very high in protein. It becomes very frothy and the plasma albumin levels go down and that's called nephrotic syndrome. Uh, and it can also be due to nutrient deficiency in starvation, quassia core, things like that. So uh, those would be some of the common things that cause low albumin. Uh, this is actually found on the complete metabolic panel, so it doesn't have to be taken as a separate liver panel. Prothrombin time, I mentioned, is a measure of coagulation. It's specifically a measure of what's called the extrinsic coagulation pathway. Um, we won't go into that at this point, but that, again, can be compromised if the liver is not putting out those coagulation proteins. And then we might look uh, for other testing at hepatitis panels for hepatitis A, B, C, etc. And then I mentioned the alpha-1 antitrypsin, the ceruloplasmin, and ferritin for iron stores. So those would be more specialized tests. Some of our common liver imaging tests would be ultrasound. Um, this is very inexpensive. It's non-invasive. Uh, readily available. Um, some doctors even have, we now have very portable ultrasounds that are fairly inexpensive. You can just have in your office uh, with training, you can use that to assess. Uh, that's going to be more in the realm of primary care and specialty care. Um, the ultrasound is going to be great for screening for any sort of bile duct obstruction, for gallstones and gallbladder disease, and um, any sort of, uh, you know, general masses that we might see. Uh, so we can actually differentiate a cyst from a solid liver tumor with ultrasound. But once we find a solid tumor, then we need to go and do a CT scan or potentially an MRI to kind of detect uh, and get a better visualization on that solid tumor. Uh, there are a number of different tumors that can affect the liver. Most are benign, but some can be an indicator of liver cancer. Um, the sensitivity for detection of liver metastases uh, is around 40 to 70 percent with ultrasound. So when we suspect cancer um, has metastasized from another tumor, let's say a uh, you know, uh, colon cancer, one of the common places it ends up is in the liver and uh, ultrasound can be used to get the initial assessment on that. But typically what we do for that is a CT scan. So the CT is going to use x-ray, so it's ionizing radiation, uh, but it gets a three-dimensional image now of usually either two-dimensional or three-dimensional of the entire liver, uh, abdomen and pelvis. And uh, so if we see liver metastases, like in this particular picture, you can see the liver and then all these spots, these are liver mets uh, that are now growing in the liver. And so that would tell us the extent at which a cancer is metastasized. There is also a technique known as CT angiography, and that is where you inject contrast agent into the portal system or the arterial system, and we can look at the blood flow into the liver. Um, so that can be helpful as well. Um, and that's usually using IV contrast, IV iodine, and so forth. Um, so those are different techniques that can be done with CT. Excuse me. Uh, MRI scans. Um, this is sort of emerged as the best imaging test for le liver lesion detection and characterization. Gives you very clear uh, images, no ionizing radiation, much more expensive than CT and not as readily available. Uh, most ERs, for example, will have a CT scanner available, but not an MRI. Um, and then uh, various contrast agents are used in the MRI, and that's typically something like gadolinium. 
Um, so that can be used to sort of characterize much more focal and smaller lesions uh, in the liver. Um, then angiography, that can be done either with a catheter or if I just mentioned CT scan, and that can tell us about the vasculature. Um, so there are a couple of conditions that can cause blood clots in the portal vein. It can cause something called Bud Chiari syndrome. We'll talk about that later. Um, but that um, is something that could be picked up on angiography. And then for metastatic liver disease, PET scans also can be used. Um, and uh, basically what happens is that uh, the, uh, this radioactive glucose is um, uh, injected intravenously. Tumors have greater glucose uptake, so they'll concentrate in the tumors, and then the special uh, camera can pick up the radiation from those tumors. It's not radiation that's going to... Um, in, uh, in the amounts that are given that's dangerous, uh, but this uh, lets you kind of characterize the metastases more clearly. And then liver biopsy, and, and importantly, unlike the uh, MRI or CT, it allows you to see what is active metabolically, which is really what we need to know. And then liver biopsy is where we're going to go through the skin um, and remove portion of the liver tissue. Uh, it's done with anesthetic. It's the gold standard for assessing the stage and grade of chronic liver disease. Um, but as you can imagine, there's a risk of adverse events in about 2 to 3% of patients. Typically done uh, outpatient, but often um, it, it can be done in the hospital setting in case there are any adverse events as well. Again, uh, for some conditions like hepatitis C, we're now trying, we're trying to go more towards blood test. There's something called the FibroSure test, um, which can um, tell us about the extent of liver fibrosis as opposed to doing a biopsy. So that's sort of an overview of the assessment tools for liver disease. Now, in terms of treatment for liver disorders, it's going to be very similar to what we've seen so far. We're going to follow the therapeutic order. So uh, uh, obviously for presence of jaundice or any of those red flags, we want to get a biomedical assessment to actually know what's going on. Many of your patients, if you're in acupuncture, might already come to you with um, you know previous diagnoses and uh, they're going to already have their specialists and they probably already have their level four therapies going. Uh, but these would be various things such as antiviral medications. Uh, we now have, for example, for hepatitis C, uh, there are medications that have over 90% cure rate, some of them within three months. Um, and uh, interferons and other antiviral, different chelators for iron and copper disorders. But as you can see, the list is a little shorter here than for other, can, other um, organ systems. Um, typically, uh, that's because, again, most of the liver disorders don't result until the very end stages in a lot of pain or discomfort, so we're not using a lot of NSAIDs and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, surgical care might be something, specialty care, a lot of that would be centered around you know, more specific imaging and then coming up with specific treatment regimens like for hep C and whatnot if that's needed. Um, but for our um, supportive treatments, you know, our basic healthy diet, exercise lifestyle, stress reduction guidelines apply, and then there are many, many different um, patterns of neuroendocrine organ dysfunction. And um, so in Chinese medicine, we have things like liver cheek constriction, blood stasis, liver fire, damp heat, and so forth. So I've just listed them out here. And they, of course, all would be assessed using the pulse tongue diagnosis and then uh, appropriate herbal therapies uh, developed around those. Uh, and then we have uh, our you know, replacement therapy if necessary. Not going to be too necessary, except maybe in the more advanced stages of cirrhosis and whatnot to do any sort of IV replacement of nutrition. So that's an overview of the treatment modalities. Now, I just want to include here this idea of what we call functional liver disease. Um, this is what is often addressed in functional medicine or, uh, you, know, um, you know, acupuncture, naturopathy, that sort of thing. Um, usually these are not recognized as biomedical disorders, and so patients are not really given any ideas about this. Uh, these are, of course, different, but may occur with uh, what we might call true or lesional liver pathologies. So some of the functional liver patterns we might see would be something like poor liver detox. So remember, there's the phase one and phase two detoxification. Phase two is 
specific to the liver, and that involves conjugation with six different um, uh, enzyme systems. Um, and uh, this can result if these are compromised in poor clearance of things like histamine and allergies. Sex hormones, in particular estrogen, will accumulate. Um, and we see this also in cirrhosis and other more advanced liver diseases, but you know, we also tend to see this in patients maybe with a lot of dysmenorrhea or a lot of menstrual irregularities. They're not able to clear the estrogen appropriately. In Chinese medicine, this is of course called a liver qi stagnation, same idea. Um, and stress hormones like cortisol also are largely cleared through the liver. Um, you know, estrogen and cortisol, all the sex hormones are steroid hormones. And what's very important about that is that uh, we actually cannot break down. So remember, these are based on the skeleton of cholesterol. Um, and we have no enzymes that can break down that skeleton once we've made it or once it enters the body. Um, so the only way to get rid of these is through the bile. But to do that, we, it ha they have to go through phase one and phase two detox. So the steroid has to have, for example, a methyl group attached to it or a sulfate group or glucuronic acid or one of the other six uh, enzyme systems. Uh, and that enters the bile and then that's excreted, hopefully, in the feces. And that's how we remove it. Some of it goes through and gets reabsorbed and we excrete it in the urine. Um, so that's a typical detox, but if we have sluggish phase two, we can't properly methylate or sulfate, uh, we're going to have a buildup of these hormones and now we're going to see excess, um, you know, accumulation and effects from those hormones. Heavy metals, the liver actually creates peptides, um, that can chelate and take out heavy metals like mercury, any of the divalent metals, mercury, cadmium, uh, and lead, um, remove those from the body. Um, so the liver is very important for that. Uh, environmental dietary toxins and then medications are constantly cleared by the liver as well. And I, uh, in the physiology section, we talk about Tylenol and the metabolites of Tylenol that build up after phase one that have to be detoxed through phase two. And so the liver is important for that. Um, so that would be poor liver detox. But once we make all this and enters the bile, if the bile is not flowing, it's not being produced adequately, is, is getting stuck up in the biliary ducts, that can result in a backup, basically. And uh, another thing that's really eliminated through the bile, of course, is cholesterol, but also your triglycerides. Um, so those come out. So if we have a backup, we're gonna start to see an increase of plasma triglycerides and cholesterol. Um, and then, of course, decreased clearance of all these different drugs. So we call this cholestasis. Now, cholestasis is a biomedical condition, but we usually see this in more advanced liver pathology. But I think it's a lot more common than we think. We're usually not looking for it. And so I've had many people go get routine ultrasounds for whatever reason, and um, they, they have some that comes back showing they have some degree of cholestasis. And uh, so this is uh, interesting because we actually have a lot of good therapies, uh, herbs that are known as cholagogues that can actually stimulate the bile flow and production. And then poor liver anabolism. So the other aspect of the liver, so detox is part of the broader anabolic process of the liver. So that's building up glycogen and storing glycogen. So if glycogen is not properly stored, come one to three in the morning when your blood sugar falls, there won't be any glycogen there in the liver to supply your blood sugar. So you get hypoglycemic and then you release stress hormones to try to get your blood sugar back up again. Um, and that's a classic cause that we might call liver insomnia. Um, so hypoglycemia, insomnia might happen from the uh, liver glycogen storage problems. Lipid metabolism, we might start to see too much uh, and that usually is under the influence of insulin, but too much production of lipids, um, triglycerides in particular, and cholesterol, and then they accumulate in the liver, and that's going to cause fatty liver. And we'll see that that's a hallmark. Uh, for example, type 2 diabetes, we see a lot of fatty liver with that. Also happens with alcoholism. Um, uh, liver is important for protein metabolism, synthesizing the al adequate albumin and whatnot. Importantly, the liver puts out a large amount of different antioxidants. Glutathione, we mentioned, was one of them. And uh, so when that's low, the ability of the liver to quench free radical damage around the body is going to be diminished. And then lastly, another anabolic aspect is about 30% in the 
The literature varies on this depending on where you look, but basically um, we, we suspect about 30% of the conversion of T4 to T3, and this is the active thyroid hormone, T3, occurs in the liver. Um, and so we need proper liver function for proper thyroid metabolism. Uh, so that's uh, some of the aspects of functional liver disorders. And so in the Chinese medicine thinking, we have the yang aspect, which is a metabolism of the liver. So we can think of low metabolism as being um, lack of the, all those uh, detox activities, uh, what we might call mitochondrial dysfunction, and so forth. Liver fire would be the opposite. That would be more the heat pattern inflammation. Uh, we'd see uh, increased cortisol, glucagon, and uh, there is a pattern known as liver wind, usually associated with hypertension. And that has to do often with the accumulation of a hormone from your adrenals called aldosterone, which raises your blood pressure. Again, liver has to detox that. And so if that builds up, we'll get blood pressure. Uh, liver damp heat would be similar, but we might think of this as more with the high insulin picture driving all that lipid synthesis and so forth. Uh, liver chi would be the autonomic nervous system activity, so either lack of vagal tone or too much sympathetic tone, uh, and that's going to compromise. So liver chi constraint, we're going to see uh, poor phase 2 detox, we're going to see accumulation of estrogens, low thyroid, and we get the classic kind of anger, irritability, all, uh, lots more pain with, with menses that we might see uh, that we describe in Chinese medicine as a chi stagnation or constraint pattern. And then liver blood and yin would be more the liver storage of glycogen, production of proteins, so yin deficiency, we're having low activities there. Don't really have a yin excess, we might think of that as more of a phlegm or overproduction case. Um, and then there is a possibility of blood stagnation, which would be an increased thrombotic picture, and that might lead to venous thrombosis. You get blood clots within the venous system, like I mentioned, that condition called Bud Chiari. Um, can uh, results uh, from that. So that would be just an overview. And again, there are specific treatments that could be aimed herbally uh, and through acupuncture at each of these different patterns. So that's a summary for kind of introduction to liver gallbladder pathology in terms of assessment and treatment. And now we'll jump into individual liver gallbladder disorders.